session. That's always a wonderful thing that people don't have too many high expectations. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm on a beginning point. But my job this term was to actually organize the Positive Link series for the, for the term. And um, for any of you who know me, um, I am passionate about positive relationships as central to um, ideas about positive organizations. And as a result, we've, we've um, designed a, a series um, this term that's focused on different angles on positive relationships. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about compassion. Um, but then next, week, next month, we have Barb Fredrickson, who, if any of you are involved in positive psychology, she is one of the leaders in positive psychology. And she's written a wonderful, very provocative book called Love 2.0. And she's going to be here in October to, uh, to, do, to uh, talk about that work. Um, then we have Dottie Dorimo, who is the CEO and president of, uh, Michigan, of Hospice of Michigan. So she will... I think be a very exciting speaker for us. And then our own Wayne Baker, who is our uh, sort of resident sociologist in the center, and he's going to talk about social networks and the dynamics of generosity. So it promises to be a great term. So um, I'm going to look forward to you attending, I hope, uh, more than just today. Um, but this session is about compassion. And I thought I should start out with a story um, that tells you a little bit about why I am so um, deeply committed to the importance of this to topic for all people in all kinds of organizations. And this comes from my own experience at Michigan, where I sit at the interface of an Ellison A department and, um, um, and the business school. And 12 years ago, or well actually longer than that, 23 years ago, we had um, a, a trauma happen in our family, where, which was you know, an occasion for um, what I would say was real suffering. And what was so remarkable was um, the two, de we, both my husband and I were in two departments, and um, those departments are filled with good people. So this is not a difference in the two departments in terms of the quality of the human beings in those departments. But there was a noticeable difference in the capacity of, of one department over the other to provide compassion to us in the wake of that suffering. And as I look back to why I've been so interested in compassion in organizations and what, the difference that workplaces can make in terms of uh, fostering compassion, I think it comes from my own um, really significant experience of, of, uh, of, the, of the difference and what that did for my own resilience and my own capacity to heal. So that's where the, uh, where the, origin, the personal interest originated. But it is exciting times. It is exciting times if you're interested in compassion in work organizations. Um, I started this work 12 years ago, and I would never have imagined that um, there would be as much interest in compassion and work as there is now. I don't know what it is. It's a zeitgeist, but something is happening. There's this deep opening of a conversation about compassion broadly, societally. And just here are a couple of the in indicators. In 2008, Karen Armstrong gave a wonderful um, TED Talk um, and in which she proposed the Charter for Compassion, which was supposed to be a global charter to try to uplift the level of compassion in society globally. Um, when I checked this morning, there were 100,000 signatures. But what's more, much more important than, than uh, the number of signatures is sort of the spin-off social movements that have come from that Charter for Compassion. One of those social movements is the Compassion Action Network, which is a global organization which is sponsoring the certification of um, compassionate cities, compassionate schools, compassionate universities. I mean, it's extraordinary. In fact, right now we're in the midst of there's a, um, a competition for compassion between uh, two cities. Can you believe that? Where they're actually trying to measure, you know, the uplift and the level of kindness in a, in a, in a city, and they're having competition between, I think it's between Seoul, uh, and, um, and Seattle, right, this year. But there's a, it's just very interesting that this is sort of happening. Um, just two other things to note is um, two kind of high-status uh, university settings. So Stanford has a, has a wonderful center for um, altruism and compassion. Um, if you're interested in this topic, get on their Facebook page. It's amazing. They're disseminating a ton of information. They are trying to have most of their impact in healthcare and trying to, again, uplift the capacity for institutional compassion in healthcare. 
Um, but um, the University of Chicago has a recently funded center on the science of virtues, and compassion is sort of a major piece of some of their efforts as well. And finally, the Dare to Care, um, this is the logo from, believe it or not, the Academy of Management, which is our large 18,000 person academy of uh, professors and professionals interested in management, had their uh, global conference two years ago on, on um, Dare to Care. So it was about care and compassion. There's now been special issues of our top journals in, in management and compassion. So again, the time is ripe. Don't quite understand why it is ripe, but it's, it, there seems to be an awakening to the, to the importance of this topic. Um, so what I want to do today with you is engage you with, kind of lay a little bit of groundwork about some foundation assumptions and definitions about compassion, but I also want to give you the bottom line. You know, in some sense, I want to be able to give you what I know to be the best evidence about why we should care about compassion and uplifting the capacity for compassion, both for what it does for individuals and, importantly, what it does for organizations. And then it will lead us to the question about so if that's true, if this really does matter with these kinds of outcomes, then how do we foster compassion, particularly in organizations? Um, I mean, psychologists look more at how do you foster an individual's capacity for compassion. In fact, you can go to Stanford and take a one-week, two-week course on how to increase your own capacity for compassion. But as an organizational person interested in positive organizations, you know, I think one of the ways we can really leverage, particularly leaders and managers thinking about compassion, is how do we institutionalize or sort of build conditions in which it's more likely that that individual capacity can be enriched and leveraged and released in an organization. Um, unfortunately, on the positive side, institutions matter in enabling compassion, but they also block compassion. So I think it's also really important to think about what are the conditions in organizations that, that um, make compassion, the expression of compassion actually difficult. Um, and then I'll end with what I hope are some practical implications. And if it all works to the timing, and there's no clock, I really wish there were a clock here, so I'm going to be a little bit rude and have to look at my watch a little bit, but I have three little breakouts. So I, wanna, I, wa I don't want this to be just me, you know, talking to you, although I do love my slides. I do really love my slides. Um, I also am going to invite you in to engage uh, in a couple of ways. So the goals is that I want to have you leave here with an appreciation um, uh, of compassion and a remembrance of compassion, that if this is an innately human, beautiful thing. Um, the importance of the organizational context for facilitating and for hindering compassion. And um, again, for those of you who are students, how many of you are students here? <coughs> okay, um, for students, how many of you are leaders or managers here? Okay, how many of you are academics? Okay, <laughs> just trying to get a sense of it. All of us, no matter what our roles, I think are going to benefit if we have a, a more discerning eye about how to choose organizations that are going to be compassionate, whether those are organizations that are going to employ you, whether those are organizations that are going to serve you, you know, in the sense of they're, they're providing some sort of important service to you. It's important for us to know what are the indicators that an organization is likely to be more compassionate and then, obviously, as a, as a management leadership person, I care a lot about how do we design workplaces uh, that are more compassionate. Um, okay, so some starting definitions. The word, the word compassion sort of says it all. Compasio. Compasio. Um, it is to be with the sufferer. And I love Jack Kornfield. He's not an academic, but a very uh, wise person. His definition of compassion, it is the heart's response, the heart's response to suffering. Um, psychologists have been doing a wonderful job showing us, especially in the last five years, that we're born to do this. We are born, our bodies are finely tuned to both uh, feel and notice the suffering of other living entities and to respond towards that suffering. So an infant, when they detect another uh, um, human being crying will turn not away from that crying, but will turn towards that crying. Again, the heart's open response to the suffering of others. And what we've done um, is in our work, uh, following on work with sociolo that sociologists have contributed to this area, is we've said it's not enough to think about compassion as a thing. We have to think about it as a process, that it involves noticing suffering, feeling 
the empathetic concern of suffering and responding to that to that suffering or pain. So we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about this today, very much um, in that way. And it made me realize, actually, that um, I haven't mentioned yet that I'm speaking on behalf of a group. So I'm here speaking on behalf of Compassion Lab, which at the end I'm going to formally list the people. But there's been a group of us doing this work for the last 12 years, and without a doubt, it's been one of the most joyful experiences to be part of this um, research lab working on this together. So anything I say and I claim that um, it should be a we. Um, now there's two kinds of compassion that we studied. One is interpersonal compassion. So this is, would be um, if, you know, for Gretchen or I, if either one of us have experienced some pain, sort of understanding the dynamics of how two people respond to suffering. Um, and, but I've also mentioned that um, we've been studying differences in organizational units in terms of how compassionate they are. And the picture here of the two women smiling is the unit that probably has taught us, especially in the beginning, the most about compassion. This is the billing department at Jackson Community College. It was Jackson, excuse me, Jackson Community um, Hospital. And um, many years ago, we went into, we actually, we wanted to study the hospital. We wanted to study the whole hospital of compassion, and everybody kept telling us we needed to go to the billing department. <coughs> now, the billing department, I mean, this is the people that, call on the phone and when people haven't paid their bill to get them to pay back their, you know, it's a very hard job. Most of the people working there had minimum wage. They had a seven-year lineup of people who wanted to work at the billing department. And as we went in to study them, we studied them very intensively, um, both at sort of doing observations and interviews, but we also gave them cameras, all the members of the, of the billing department cameras to sort of create kind of a day in the life of people in the billing department. It was an extraordinary place where people would talk about going to work. And most of these, the women that worked there were low income, had very tough life circumstances at home. And they would talk about learning to love at work and going back to their children and being, be, being better parents. At the same time, they were third best in state in terms of the speed with which they uh, collected a dollar. So this was not an organization that was compassionate and not high performing. They were deeply, high, highly performing in terms of the mission of what they were doing. But they were also had the kind of soil that was growing people in ways that they felt people were over and over again said that they as human beings were becoming more loving, more caring, more compassionate. It was an amazing place. Okay, so another assumption. Suffering is pervasive. There's always pain in the room. Look around. You know, we are very good in most settings at covering our pain. We'll talk about that when we talk about the barriers. I mean, because we have to carry on. That's just part of living and part of, particularly a part of work institutions. But let there be no doubt. There is always pain in the room. And the, and the question again is, would we be better off as uh, leaders and managers, if, we, if that's an inevitable fact of life, if we could also have compassion in the room, you know, in ways that's a very sort of natural healing force. So there's many sources of human suffering. I mean, these are just a few. Um, we have the individual things that I think probably each of us has experienced, but organizations also cause pain. They cause pain and suffering, <clears throat> sometimes through everyday interactions that people experience as incivil, as, I mean, the level of disrespect that's happening in workplace institutions is frightening. It's totally related to the, in some sense, the level of stress that people are experiencing on the jobs and the fact that people are being asked to do more with less, um, with just, with other kinds of resources in their lives drying up. So incivility, unfortunately, is a major cause of human suffering at work. Uh, corrosive politics, downsizing, and sometimes it's incompetence. So, the point here is that um, suffering is pervasive. Now, so is compassion, I'm going to say. So what I'd like you to do is, let's bring some compassion into the room. What I'd like you to do is um, pair up at your table and think about, if you can think of a time in the last month where, you, where either you have experienced compassion from somebody or you've witnessed compassion. Sometimes it, and part of the reason I'm doing this is is that um, what we've learned in our research is actually compassion is everywhere, but we don't pay attention to it as much. And so part of what I want to do is 
is, is bringing into sort of your awareness. So, so share a story, and, and one of the things you could think about is what prompted the compassion? So that sort of gets you thinking about what, what was the pain about? Um, how was the compassion expressed, and what are its impacts? So I'm just going to give you five minutes to, to share, each share a story with each other and start to explore what compassion looks like in the workplace. For those of you who are in school, it doesn't matter if it's, we're talking about a workplace or a school place. We're talking about an organizational setting. Thanks. Breakout about people sharing compassion. So oh, okay. It'll just be like another two minutes. Okay. So yeah, let's see if there's yeah, any okay. 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 Yeah, that's okay. what I do. Yeah, but please. Yeah. Okay, hey, about one more minute. One more minute. Okay, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I wish I had my bell. Ding, ding, ding. How do I 
and how do I stop them? Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> sorry, I forgot my bell, but I think this is a good sign. I'm, I'm sorry to disconnect you, especially when I'm talking about positive relationships. I, I mean, it's actually telling that there's was, was this much energy about it. So let's just share a couple things. Anyone willing to share a, a little snippet of what they shared about um, what did compassion look like at work? What was it? How did it show up in your story, Mary? That's a f I mean, I, my guess is, that, again, based on the research, is that that's actually an unusual experience. You said this was Beaumont, right? Yep. This is at Beaumont. Yeah, so it's just interesting that actually health care institutions are, are actually very worried about this, that people are not leaving feeling like they got the best hospital experience, did not feel it's compassion. So that's a wonderful story. How about another one, different one, over from this side of the room? Okay, Anna? Yeah, what I love about that example is, again, a lot of what we find, and you'll see in some of what I'm sharing with you, is sort of the emergent organizing, the very, again, human, not just individual response, but collective response to suffering. And organizations that are more compassionate actually let that emergent, uh, sort of, almost you can must imagine a flower growing, happen. In fact, they'll fertilize it a little bit. So that's a beautiful story. I know Kim's work has, um, Kim has studied organizational downsizing, one of the many, th many things he's studied in, um, like in the kinds of situations your colleagues found themselves to be in, and found that organizations that downsize in virtuous ways, you know, actually over time perform financially better. So uh, we can think about the compassionate response being what the organization does more officially, or again, more unofficially, how these informal organizing dynamics um, you know, foster a capability for compassion. So I'm hoping that, that um, you know, you, you realize that sort of as you start to think about it, um, there actually are occasions like this, but we don't typically, uh, sometimes we don't notice them, sometimes we don't share them, sometimes we don't even think of them as diagnostic of the soil of an organization. That's part of what I'm going to try to argue to you is that compassion is an indicator of the quality of the social connections between people. And that if, you know, it, because compassion is such a natural, like inborn human capacity, um, if you're in an organization with healthy soil that has the kinds of practices that allow for the cultivation of these quality connections, compassion will happen. It will happen and it will be beautiful. Beautiful in the sense of it being deeply competent. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, so there's many different forms of compassion. Um, I, you know, one of the most potent in the research is simply presence, attention. It's not solving things. It's literally being present to the, to the pain that's, pre that's there. So um, it, I think a very natural uh, instinct is to try to solve or figure out exactly what to do. But in the research shows that power of presence can be in and of itself. Just being heard that the suffering is there, that the pain in there is often times puts people in a different state that uh, is remedial in the sense of bringing back some of their capacities for action. Uh, in work organizations, flexibility and time is one of the most important sort of generous things that can, can be uh, an indicator of compassion. Social support, material support like uh, meals or other kinds of um, 
uh, resources devoted to people. And, and I think in Anna, your case, the example of coordinated resources that serve the unique circumstances of someone who's suffering. Um, I, I mentioned that um, our research suggests that there's lots of different ways to sort of gauge the competence and compassion. One of the ways that we've talked about it is it has to do with the timing, the scope, the magnitude, and the, the level of customization of the response to the unique needs of, um, of uh, other people. And I, just to give you a sense of this, um, I'm going to give you a really what I find to be a really powerful example. So one of the companies that we got very interested in when we first started doing this was, was Cisco. Cisco's has actually had a lot of downsizing, especially of late. And um, they are consistently, the people that are downsized at Cisco often talk about like being downsized really well. It sort of fits what Kim has talked about in terms of virtuous downsizing. But I want to give you another Example, and this is an example of somebody that we interviewed. I'm calling him uh, Ari. That's a disguised name, um, and, but this is not disguised. That he is. He was a district manager uh, for a technical sales group um, in a country in the Middle East. Um, he worked for Cisco. This is really important. For one year, three months, um, on February 7, 2001. So we did this interview a while ago. He was riding his bike in a city park, and he had a terrible fall. What happened next? I want to show to you. Now, imagine what I'm going to do is paint a picture of a flower growing. So when you see compassion, it's, it's literally this generative human form that is growing. In this particular case, what happened to Ari, again, a short-term employee, okay, not, hadn't been there long-term, low power, so he's not someone sort of in is a high status. Look at what happened for him. Okay, I'm going to, t uh, his father, when he had his, his call, his father called Ari's boss, who at that time was the country manager, while Ari was in the hospital paralyzed. And there are two parallel responses that I just want you to see. One is local and one is global. And that's oftentimes what we see in, in organizations that are really compassionate. There's the local response, and then there's a more systemic, so, so like a local emergent response, and then there's a more systemic response. So at the global level, the country manager notified his country's HR manager and the HR manager in Europe. The president of EMEA, that's uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, directs the country managers to do whatever it takes to support Ari and his family. Cisco's management in Europe keeps checking with management in the home country. The president of EMEA and the Vice President of Operations call Ari in the hospital before his second surgery to provide him mental support. They wrote to, make, to Ari to make sure he knew his job was secure, and the President of EMEA and the VP of Operations stayed in touch with management of Ari's home country to make financial ar arrangements. Now the employees in the home country donated vacation, vacation days, which were converted to money and they were matched by country management and matched by corporate headquarters in the U.S., and they were approved by John Chambers, who's uh, still the um, CEO of, of Cisco. When, when Ari was released from the hospital and returned to work, he received several emails from the president, oh, yeah, from the president of EMEA and from John Chambers himself. I'll talk about that later. <coughs> At the local level, okay, so that's what's happening in corporate. This isn't even that visible to Ari. This is, this is what's happening kind of more at the, at the organizational collective level. At the, at the local level, the manager came to the hospital right away. As soon as he heard about this happening, he brought food to all the people waiting there and a cell phone for use in the family. Now, you have to under, remember, this is 2001. Cell phones were not like cell phones. I mean, that was a prized possession to have a cell phone at the hospital. Um, they kept visiting at the hospitals and offering help through multiple surgeries. The country manager kept in daily contact with Ari's family to inquire about the progress and to offer help. The country manager, regional manager, and area sales manager all assured him job security, that say, saying that his job would be there when physically and mentally he was ready. And they also discussed special needs and the fact that the, jo the job would be adjusted to his special needs. Um, in the rehab center where he was for three months, um, they, the area manager arranged carpenter who designed and manufactured a special desk that allowed him to work and use the laptop 
at the time. Um, again, at the time, that was, uh, that was hard to do. The country manager met with Ari to determine his special needs and the medical equipment after his stay. In the company meeting, they raised that they would not be able to cover the financial costs of the equipment, and it was that discussion, actually, at the local level that prompted the sharing of the unused vacation days. And on a Jewish holiday, I think I've got this lined up, yeah, the team arranged to have the sales meeting at the rehab center. So this whole sales team went to the rehab center, bought, bringing food, beverages, and candles for the whole rehab center. And before returning to the office, the area manager had assured office space that would accommodate his wheelchair and special needs. They altered the scope of his job um, responsibilities, and the market served to accommodate the special needs. Now, management, management uh, continued to help work out the insurance coverage and help to lease a new car that would accommodate his physical needs. Now, this is an extreme case. I mean, it's an extreme case in some ways, but it was normal. At Cisco, it was normal. We talked to people in the United States. We talked to people in other countries. Um, and I've share, I shared the detailing of this case just because it's extreme in the sense of this is a, a fairly short-term employee who's not that high up. Uh, and the level of, again, a sort of emergent compassion, again, in an institution and in a culture that really value compassion is quite amazing. And I'm trying to, what, trying to get you to sort of expand your sense of the possibility of, you know, what workplaces could do. Because Cisco, um, even though they've had a little bit of financial trouble as of late, historically has been a, a highly successful company. So this is not an example where compassion is, is in, some, um, in some ways undermining their capacity to be um, both financially and strategically excellent. And one, in fact, one could argue, you know, imagine hearing, I mean, just as Ari told us this story with great passion, you know, we're strangers calling him on the phone. You can imagine among the employee networks what this kind of story might be. Um, might do in terms of people's attachment to the organization. Um, okay, that's an extreme case of sort of the positive case. Let me just, we have in our work run into a lot of very horrible examples where people have really had extensive secondary suffering because of the way they, their suffering has been treated in the workplace. I'm just going to read you the one on the left because it comes from a university setting. Um, and uh, one of the, we've, we have studied faculty. This is a Faculty member reporting um, uh, a response of a peer when his father passed away. So a professor whose father passed away recalls a colleague's impatient response to a pain. He said to me, so how long do you think it will take you to get over this? Three weeks maybe? And I almost said, you know. And I just looked at him and said, no, I think it's going to take a lot longer than that. And again, the research would suggest that these, uh, these kinds of acts of um, real uh, disrespect in the face of suffering, again, have a long half-life. These are the kinds of stories that, um, again, get perpetuated and shared. And just like the positive stories generate incredible uh, capacity for further compassion, this shuts down, shuts down um, people. People are fearful of being compassionate. They're fearful of sharing their own pain. So how does it work? It matter at work? Again, I, the research is really compelling on this. And behind each one of these uh, little bullets is actually, uh, I think, some, some research that, that really supports it. One is compassion has a, a biological impact on us. So we experience both the giving of compassion and receiving compassion. It does good things. Uh, this is referring more to, the, um, to what it does for the... Um, for the person who's, who's giving compassion, or receiving compassion. One is that it physiologically strengthens people, their immune systems, their cardiovascular systems. Um, it helps people be more resilient and recover. Um, again, uh, small acts of compassion can, can really cultivate a capacity for resilience in other people. And it cultivates a positive identity. And again, this works both ways. So. Um, Adam Grant and Brent Rosso and I did a study um, actually uh, several years ago now because Borders been out of existence for a while. It was at Borders. It was looking at their um, Borders Foundation. And in Borders Foundation, people, could put, uh, people who worked at Borders had the choice to put a dollar per week from their paycheck into this foundation, basically pot of money that then people could apply for if they had different kinds of incidents of suffering in their lives. 
And what was really striking about the research was what it meant to the people who were donating that dollar, that it changed how they thought about who they were as employees. It sort of helped them to see themselves as more virtuous, as more caring, compassionate people, which we know from other research that if you see yourself, if you define yourself in these more positive ways, it actually psychologically and physically, physiologically makes you stronger. So compassion fortifies us. It also grows us. It grows us into people who are healthier um, and people who are happier. It connects us. I mentioned that there's this sort of deep intertwining between the quality of connection between people and the capacity for compassion. It connects us to each other. So our research suggests that if you're in a workplace that where people, you're able to both experience and witness more compassion, you feel more connected to other people. You define yourself more as a community. You can imagine that that feeling and perception has huge impacts on your, your ability to collaborate, your ability to cooperate. So there's a relationship between these things that I'm talking about and strategic and your seat strategic capabilities. It connects us more to the organization. And one of the questions that we got, um, that I got before the talk, I guess a new feature of, that Janelle has put into Positive Links is when you sign up, you can add question to the speaker. One of the questions um, I was asked by someone attending this, I don't know who it is, uh, but it's a question that I get a lot is sort of, you know, um, what is, what are the hard consequences of this soft capacity? And one of the hard consequences, one of the bottom line sort of consequences of, of having an organization where you have a higher capacity capacity is people are more engaged and they're more committed. And when you want to attract and retain uh, the best talent in a workplace, you want people who are sticky, you know, who don't want to leave the organization. And compassion, again, these, these small episodes of compassion have, have uh, real strong sticking power in the sense of, of increasing people's at felt attachment to the workplace um, and their engagement, so their ability to bring their full selves to work. And, in, and what I love about this is that um, if, if, uh, people experience more compassion, it also connects us more deeply to our humanity. And so there is sort of a, almost a transcendent impact of this, that it connects us to something more existential and bigger. You know, we're connected to something of a higher purpose. It inspires us. So witnessing compassion, we don't even have to expect to uh, impact it. We don't even have to experience it directly. If we see other people, um, receiving compassion, it again has one of these virtuous, wonderful, positive spirals. It increases our own generosity and our own capacity to care. And I've mentioned a couple of these already. Um, com compassionate work organizations are ones where people are more attached and committed. They have higher quality connection. They tend to have more hope as a collective. The, the quality of the service delivered is higher and there's greater cooperation capability. And, you know, I just want to say, I mean, I was a strategy professor for my first seven years. I care a lot about organizations' uh, ability to compete <laughs> uh, and win uh, on a sustainable basis. These are the kinds of qualities that are not imitable by competitors. You can't buy these qualities. These are the kinds of qualities that are cultivated. They're in the quote-unquote soil of a place, and they're very difficult. Even if you try to hire the people or throw money, you're not going to create this capacity. So even though these look kind of soft, they actually translate into non-imitable competitive advantage in organizations where collaboration and cooperation and those kinds of things are really critical to providing your service or your product. Okay, so next breakout. Now, new partner. What I, I'm not going to ask you to do three indicators. All right, imagine that um, you have the opportunity to look for a new job or to... Uh, look for a new doctor, or to look for a new lawyer, you know, or any other service, and you're trying to figure out, okay, what, how do I discern whether this practice or this organization is, you know, has the capacity for compassion? I mean, if you're in healthcare, you want to know that. Uh, but, you know, actually, again, lawyers, I mean, uh, you know, anybody who's had to work with lawyers, I mean, their capacity to empathize, to feel people suffering and to respond to it in a way that makes the other person more capable and provide, is, is something really important. So what I'd like you to think about is what would be the one indicator you would use to discern, if you had to get it down to one indicator that in fact an organization is compassionate, what would it be? 
So, give you five minutes. <coughs> Okay, ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay, ding, ding, ding. Um, sorry to have to cut you off again. Let's get some ideas on the table. What kinds of things would you pay attention to? How about something from this table? What would, what would be? Humor. And, and why humor? Ah, so that someone being humorous. If, if I said something and they said something and I see you like, oh my gosh. Okay, so, yeah, so, so you're looking for indicators of that responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What else? Yeah. So one of the things that came up is like when you're making that first phone call and it's a new impression, then mention it. How long can you talk without being interrupted? Mm. Okay, now it's so interesting that, I mean, it's sort of suggesting that we all have schema in our heads about sort of things that we're looking for. We don't always know if they really are accurate sort of indicators, but the important point is we're trying to tell. You know, what is the, what's the person like? What is the quality of the interaction? Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, so someone who's... 
And it's interesting, like, if you're not a member of the organization yet, in other words, if you've not traveled over their boundaries, then to discern listening, you're often on the phone, you know, or, in other, or over the Internet, you know, in ways that are really um, sort of shallow in terms of your capacity to discern, kind of, you know, is someone really actively or authentically listening to me? Or are they just going through a protocol? Mm. Okay, so you, yeah, so you, so you too have developed sort of a, a detector system to sort of figure it out. Great. And I'm, I'm all for these detector systems. Yeah. I listen to whether the person asks a question that does not presuppose an answer. Mm. So uh, asking a question where they really mean it, <laughs> where they're ge there's a genuine interest. Ah, great. What else? Yeah. Yeah. What I hear so far in all of these is sort of some sort of indicators that sort of there's a, a genuine responsiveness from the other as opposed to a standardized, sort of protocolized uh, way of interacting. Um, are there other things besides these are all sort of talking about the quality of interaction. What if you're a, like an MBA student or undergrad student and you're trying to figure out, uh, you, you know, from just looking at the website, for example, how compassionate the organization. Is there things that you would look at? Dave. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, leadership um, with this, I mean, who, who is, if you have the inside information about what kind of leaders that are, they are, really, it really helps you. But leaders are a real indicator, right, Rob, of, uh, you know, kind of the heart of, it, heart of an organization. And there's been really interesting studies about narcissism and leaders and, like, the size of pictures and, you know, looking at pictures. You know, it's not a perfect indicator, but, it, you know, who's showcased and what are they showcased doing can be, you know, uh, an important window into an organization. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that what I'm hearing in a lot of what people are saying too, um, with the exception of sort of these points on, on, on leadership, are that you, you are trying to discern what is the quality of the social fabric. It, you know, is it a real collaborative community where people are really attuned to each other or is this just, for example, up front? Well, let me give you a couple of things that our research suggests that you should pay attention to um, that are facilitators of compassion. And some of these are more uh, accessible to you than others, but they might be things that you wouldn't have thought about uh, asking about or thinking about. Um, one is, let me just say, routines matter. So what an organization has routinized, you know, tills the soil in particular ways. So even again, you could have good people but what you're asked to do and how you do stuff uh, sort of, again, brings up different kinds of what psychologists would call action tendencies. So we end up behaving in kind of different ways. One important indicator around compassion is how do people learn about harm, about who's harmed, you know, if someone's suffering it or not. Is it safe, for example, to share? Does the organization facilitate um, notification of harm. And the, tricky, this is very tricky. You know, we got interested in this partly because of John Chambers, again, Cisco. He has a 20, he has a rule. He instituted all his HR managers globally. In 20, if anyone in, that's employed by uh, Cisco is um, in a sort of life-threatening sort of situation, he wants to be notified, and he personally reaches out by email or phone call within 24 hours of that notification. So he, that's an example, a radical case. of He set up a notification of harm system. Now imagine what that means symbolically 
to people, that, 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 that people at the top are sort of getting that kind of information. You might say, well, doesn't that overwhelm the system, you know, for him to be doing that? But in his particular case, he feels, again, the cost in terms of his time is worth the benefits. Not at, his HR managers know, kind of have a sense of when it sort of crosses the threshold that he needs to be notified, and they honor that. And then at the local level, again, they customize the response. But the important thing is he's being notified, and he's, he's the one reaching out. Um, some systems... Um, have notification of harm for some kind of employees and not for others. I know I've done a lot of work with the staff at the University of Michigan, and one really interesting thing, there was a chapter in the life of the business school here where we had notification of harm for the faculty. So if a faculty had lost a parent, or, but there wasn't notification of harm for the staff. So the faculty were getting you know, the, the emails of comfort. This was a long time ago. This was like 20 years ago or something. So don't think it's, it doesn't happen now. But it's interesting. Again, these, these are institutionalized practices that have implications for the noticing of suffering. Now, some people don't want to have their suffering, uh, you know, broadcast. Or, so, again, part of the wisdom and the capacity of the system is if the notification of harm is sensitive to the unique needs or um, circumstances of the individual. And in these highly compassionate units, they are sensitive. <clears throat> so routines for employee support, I mentioned the border example. Um, there's lots of, uh, of um, different forms of employee, to employee support that organizations can institutionalize that, again, facilitate compassion. Organizations to select people on the basis of how relationally skilled they are. I mean, think about um, again, uh, when you cross the threshold of an organization um, and how pe people are employee, uh, employees are selected, are they selecting just on technical skills or are they also selecting on relational skills? If they're selecting on relational skills, you're going to get people who are more competent in their capacity to respond to the suffering of others. So Southwest Airlines, I mentioned Midwest Billing, ones that actually Google Organizations that take a long time to select and select on a broader array of criteria are probably a good indication that there might be a higher capacity for, capac for compassion. And organizations that reward helping, um, helping, especially peer-to-peer -peer helping. Again, you can imagine that's kind of greasing the wheels, it's facilitating that, kind, that quality of connection that, um, that makes suffering more easily shared and compassion more easily offered. So it's not just routines. Routines are sort of the um, circuitry of behavior in an organization. It's also what gets valued in an organization. And in organizations where they truly mean it, that people experience the whole person, so who they are, not just in terms of who they show up to work as, but who they are more holistic, tend to be more compassionate. And obviously, organizations that really value, I mean really value care and respect uh, tend to be more compassionate. Organiza research suggests that um, organizational networks matter and that if you have strong and redundant ties in an organization, they tend to have uh, more compassion and uh, organizations with higher quality connections. Something that you might not have thought about is, um, is not just routines and, and culture, but um, what about roles in organizations? You know, organizations have both emergent for informal roles and formal roles. And um, <clears throat> increasingly, I mean, grief counselors are sort of a natural role that we would think about, I think, is associated with compassion. Um, but coaches are increasingly um, an indicator. An organization's willingness to invest in coaches as a sort of a role that sort of can customize um, a human-to-human -human response to the unique circumstances of another individual, particularly in service of, of uh, growing that person, tend to be, uh, facilitate compassion. But our research suggests that it's also organizations that, uh, that um, allow for the, um, the emergence of informal roles. And I'm just going to mention this role ecology. It's my favorite paper that I'm so proud of that we got published. You have to understand, like, in this little world of academia, it's like these journals get, uh, you've got A journals and B journals and C journals. We have a very good one called um, Administrative Science Quarterly. And in 2006, we published a paper. It's a story of the business school. I love this. It's a story of the Ross Business School, um, and, and it's, respond, it's a very elaborate detailing of their response to three students who lost all their stuff in a fire. 
And I love this because it's about the business school. Um, but it is a very detailed accounting of the same kind of beauty that I tried to show you in the, in, um, the way that Cisco responded to Ari, the way that the business school responded to this, which was not done by the leadership. It was emergent. It was extraordinary. And it was extraordinary in that if you looked at the emergence of these different kinds of roles, what we call role ecology, you, you had what they call fluid expertise. So people, students who had had response, who had experience with fires in the past, became clear, clear, clear expediters of what the institution did. Um, there were other people who uh, buffered all these three di different students from almost too much support. I mean, there, was, there was a lot of, um, again, emergent capability in the roles that were fostered in the, in the customization of the compassion to each of the unique students. If I pique your interest, you can go read it. It's, 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 it's in some ways my thank you note. I always sort of think this is my thank you note to the business school because, again, my experience, the story that I told you so many years ago was a story of, very, like being blown away by the capacity of the business school to be compassionate towards my husband and I, kind of in the face of this trauma. And I then studied it in many sort of different cases, and this one got published in a good place. Um, the, the, the last point is that leadership matters. Um, Rob, I'm glad you're here. Phil Lynch. Um, so leaders notice, they model, they model compassion. And, Rob uh, Pasek, who's here, and I had the privilege of going, thanks to him, to uh, study Reuters in their response to 9-11. And uh, Phil Lynch, at the time, who was the president of Reuters, uh, modeled what it was like to be compassionate, and, and his modeling spread. There was one person uh, who had lost her son, uh, a Russian immigrant who had lost her son in the towers, uh, who worked at Reuters. And... The mother didn't want to believe her son had died, and he would show up. She would show up morning at morning at, at uh, headquarters of Reuters in New York City, and Phil would just sit with her, just sit with her, you know, until she was ready to sort of accept the fact that she had lost the son. But, again, he did this privately, but the story of how he, how he responded and modeled, uh, you know, how you should respond to the pain spread um, throughout the organization. So organizations, leaders model noticing, feeling, and responding. They also profess the power of compassion. Um, Jeff Weiner, I'm totally, that's Karen Armstrong, the Charter of Compassion. Jeff Weiner, Link, CEO of LinkedIn. Um, I, he's out there, if you Google him, he talks a lot about compassion being the central skill for leadership. And, you know, if you teach in a business school, you hear a lot of CEOs say a lot of things. You don't always, like, really? You know, really? Uh, but the wonderful thing is Lindsay Reed, who's now an MBA too, was hired as, a, as an MBA one as an intern for LinkedIn. And she came in, she was working with, in the center with Betsy and, and came in and told me the story of her, how she was interviewed for LinkedIn. And the interview question was a compassion question. It was a it was, the interview question was a question posed to her about what would you do if you were intercepted by one of your managers in the hall, your corporate headquarters, to tell you that you had a woman uh, who worked for you who had just had a premature baby. The baby was in the IU uh, unit and was an hour away from the from the uh, from where they lived. What would you do? This was the interview question that was asked, and, and that was on the basis not just for hiring an employee, but for hiring an intern. For any of you who have been coached by, about what interview questions are like when you're being selected by companies, that is very unusual. Uh, and we went on to do the case, and we've got the video of the manager who, who actually interviewed her. This is a very standard kind of question, but they are trying to tell what a first response is for people to, to news about another person suffering. And they are using that as a, as a uh, determinant of whether or not someone gets in the door. I find that to be amazing. So now I really believe Jeff Weiner when he says uh, they care about compassion. And uh, this is uh, Greg Fisher, who is the mayor of Louisville. Uh, Louisville is one of the first compassionate cities. It has first certified compassionate hospitals, first certified compassionate university. I mean, Louisville is fascinating as a region that is, is sort of uh, naming, claiming of being a compassionate region as a basis for their competitive advantage. 
as a city, and they have all these institutions that have committed to it. Greg Fisher, who's the mayor there, is probably the most. Again, if you Google him, you can hear some of his speeches. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, leadership matters also for building organizations where the mission is based on compassion. Um, okay. So that's the positive side, that we actually know actually a lot about what conditions can foster compassion and how to uh, perhaps select organizations and build organizations based on the compassion. But we can't really as leaders do this well if we understand just what facilitates compassion. We have to also understand what blocks compassion. And I just want to mention a, sorry, a couple of things here, um, each of which corresponds to the different phases that I talked about that are part of this compassion process. So research suggests that there's actually several barriers to noticing suffering in organizations. I already mentioned the norms about expressing emotion. I mean, expressing positive emotions like humor and vibrancy and all that kind of things tend to be things that organizations reward. Uh, in fact, um, you know, they tend to reward a lot of positive things like that. What what people often believe and what cultures often believe will suppress is some of these negative emotions like fear, like anxiety, like sadness, those kinds of things which are an inevitable part of suffering, but, but uh, which sometimes make people think that people are less capable than they are. So there's a lot of fear about expressing emotion related to pain partly because suffering or pain can be imply weakness, and it also can be difficult to figure out the cues. So if it's not safe to mention these negative things, what do you as a manager or leader do to discern whether someone really is suffering? I remember um, a case with a student many years ago where as faculty, we actually, this happens, you know, where students will come into your office and, you know, you know, telling you a story about not being able to do something and you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, is this real or is this imagined? I've, I've learned actually, I always imagine it's real now. I mean, after doing this work, it's always real. But I'd much rather err on that side, especially for issues around mental health. Um, it's particularly difficult. And so in the face of ambiguity, again, if you don't have routines and values that make it safe for people to tell their truth in terms of what's happening, um, it stays repressed, and the suffering is never noticed. So the suffering is in the room, but the national, natural compassionate response can't happen. Um, so there's challenges to noticing. There's also challenges in interpreting suffer. If we are under stress and there's a lot of work demands, it smushes our capacity to be empathetic. So uh, high cognitive loads, exactly what we're saying, you know, is, is the normal circumstances for people actually makes it difficult for you to interpret. I mean, again, as my body wants to respond to someone who's suffering, but my, my head is saying, I don't have time. I don't have time. Don't come to me with that complicated, you know, suffering that you're having. I just... And so as a result, we shut it down. Um, and, and there's, again, in, in certain organizations, uh, well, the research suggests that we have to, if we think that the suffering has been brought on by the sufferer, you know, if we think that the person ha is suffering because of something they did uh, to bring on that suffering, uh, then we tend to be less uh, compassionate towards them. Um, and there's organizational occupational scripts that shape interpretations. This has really been driven home to me with um, research that we're doing right now. We did um, research on faculty responses in New York and New Jersey institutions to her, uh, Hurricane Sandy and the suffering of students. And what was so sort of scary was the difference in the universities uh, first response to the faculty about what they should do for the students that are suffering. Um, in certain organizations, they planted the seed of doubt, saying it's, it's exactly this time that students could take advantage of you. Be careful. Now, there's a logic to that, 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 that again, the institution perpetuates. Really different in another organization where um, it was give the students the benefit of the doubt, 
you know, there's real variability in the degree to which this is suffered. But as an organizational member, your job is to do whatever it takes for the students. So these, these logics that are sort of part of the, the shared beliefs in organizations, um, when a crisis happens, in this particular case, sort of a larger crisis rather than an individual, you know, that logic is what sort of gets people, that's, uh, shapes their first response. So that's, I think, a really important thing to notice. There's the challenge of feeling suffering. We mentioned, um, you know, it's really hard to feel it. A lot of, a lot of times we fear, feel it because of the mirror neurons, a bunch of things that are happening to our body. But if we're, if we're only talking to people on the phone or emailing with them, it's, it's difficult to really know, to really sense someone's suffering. Uh, power and status differences. I mean, again, very compelling research that shows that um, the higher up people are, um, you know, again, in experimental studies, the more powerful people are made to believe that they are, the less empathetic they are. Uh, so the less able they are to, to feel the suffering. And then people are burned out. I mean, people are tired. People are emotionally spent. And um, unless you're in organizations which actually take that exhaustion and uh, uh, seriously, it can... Um, make it very difficult for people to be compassionate. And then there's the difficult, you know, of knowing how and when to respond. And these personal professional ba barriers are really, boundaries are really important. If people have suffering happen in their home life, is it appropriate? In some organizations, the question is, is it appropriate for us to respond at work? Again, there's real organizational differences in this. Um, fairness concerns, you know, if we provide flexibility for person A, what does that mean for providing flexibility for person B? And then there's this research that shows that the more su I provide help to you, the more dependent you may become on me. And so compassion, you know, for, for um, <clears throat> certain critics is a way of creating dependency. That's not necessarily something that you want. So let me end by saying, what do we do to cultivate capacity for compassion. Well, one is to simply notice suffering. Of course, it's not so simple. Simple, but I love this phrase. You know, just remember, there's always pain in the room. There's always pain in the room. Look. Look for pain. Know that people, especially in workplaces, are going to be trying to hide it. You can, again, do an offering and sort of sense from people whether or not they want to talk about it. If they don't want to talk to it, that's fine. But again, just being present is, is important. Sense, your body often knows, even if your mind doesn't know. And when you inquire, mean it. Feel suffer, suffering by um, empathizing, listening, feeling, suspending judgment. I mean, I'm so excited about actually RLI, Ross Leadership Institute, because I think actually with what they're doing when our MBA students first arrive to Ross, is they're actually increasing the capacity of the students to feel empathy. Uh, and I'm seeing that actually in, in later, later terms in, the, in, uh, in their time at Ross. Uh, suspending judgment, that's a really important part of feeling suffering. If you, won't, you won't feel it if you're judging another person. And respond. Um, and I just want to remind, I keep having to remind myself who, like, probably like many of you, is I want to problem solve. I want to make it right. That just being with a person who's suffering can oftentimes be the most potent solution. Let your body glide you, show care, seek others' help, and choose context. Choose context where caring is normal and it's valued. Uh, within organizations, choose and develop compassionate leaders create and support compassionately aiming teams, create high-quality connections, and foster shared values. Um, I, I have Plant Moran up here because it's a, it's a beautiful example of an organization that has just done so much to promote civility. It's, it's, it is a no-jerk workplace. It's one of the first no-jerk workplaces, uh, actually, in the United States. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Michigan company. Um, but it's, they've, they've really tried to cultivate high-quality connections and compassion as a way to serve their customers better. Um, and I'll end with my final quote from Robert Wathnow, who wrote one of my favorite books on compassion called Acts of Compassion. So compassion enriches us. It ennobles us. Even those of us who are neither the caregivers nor the recipients, 
because it holds forth a vision of what a good society can be. It provides us with concrete examples of caring that we can emulate, and it locates us as members of a diffuse network of, of which society is woven. So, thank you.